Hey everybody, it's Anna, and welcome back to my booktube channel. This video is going to be my geekly wrap-up for the month of October, which was quite a time. <laughs> As I'm filming this right now, it is just after we finally got the election results in at the U.S. And although the work is far from over here, I think those of us living within the States, many of us anyway, are kind of breathing a collective sigh of relief. So... Just in case you know something super dramatic changes between now and uh, the time when this video goes live, that's where my head is at right now. I didn't really do too much reading in October. We had the Disability Readathon, which I read both, or I read two of my books for, but I managed to get through six books in October and play one new board game. I'm thinking just because of the way that life is and the way that my concentration and my reading time have both been kind of shot that for now the geekly wrap-ups are going to move to being maybe a bit of a monthly thing maybe i'll make more than one per month but i'm not able to keep up with making weekly videos at this time so just so you're aware i still want to keep making them still want to keep talking about things that i'm reading but if you see fewer videos going up on this channel that's why just trying to get like that good balance going so let's go ahead and talk about the two books that I read for Disability Readathon. The first one of those was Even If We Break by Marika Niekamp. This is a young adult horror story about a group of teenagers that go to an isolated cabin in the woods to play some sort of LARP type game together uh, where they have like an escape room mystery puzzle to solve and they all are there as their characters in character for the entire weekend. A bunch of old secrets come to light and this book has a uh, representation for multiple types of disabilities. People who use mobility aids, there's an autistic character, there are characters that are suffering from the scars of past trauma and things like that, and it is about their friendships and their relationships with each other and what changes. I expected to like this book a bit more than I did. I didn't find the horror to particularly put me on edge very much, and for me it was a little easy to figure out who the villain of the story was, but I still think that this book is very important for representation. Um, just wasn't my favorite, necessarily. I then read the Comics Journal Healthcare, Disability, Illness, and Comics issue. This is I mean, it's kind of a graphic novel, it's really like a scholarly journal, but there were a bunch of interviews in here um, with disabled comic artists and comic artists who are chronically ill. It definitely gave me some new artists and authors to check out their work, and I thought that this was, this was good. It was a little bit less about the comics and a little bit more about the process that actually went into making them, but like I said, it did give me some good new authors and artists to check out. Okay, so those were my Disability Readathon reads. I also read one new graphic novel, which was Eat and Love Yourself by Sweeney Boo. This is kind of a strange experimental way of telling a story about a girl who is in recovery from an eating disorder. So content warnings for that because that is the majority of what this, this graphic novel is about. Um, it's about this girl who's named Mindy and she is struggling to find some sense of self-worth and kind of repair her relationship with food and with her body. And she finds this mysterious chocolate bar that every time she eats it, it causes her to remember certain things from her past. And as she begins to explore these memories and these occurrences from her past, she is beginning to learn new ways to move forward and heal from the you know scars that are left on her body because of this eating disorder. Um, this book, I think, was very interesting in concept. I don't know that the execution really succeeded in the telling the story with the same heft, I want to say. Like, I did think that the artwork and the coloring was beautiful, but I think that the way that it was used to tell the story could have been stronger. I think that the message of the story was overall very, uh, very positive and very uplifting, the fact that, you know, you can heal from things that have harmed you in the past and you can heal from harming yourself. I just think that the like second half of the book was not quite as strong as the setup and the premise with the chocolate bar. Although that was an interesting way to look at a way of recuperating memories and stuff like that. I reread three books this month because like I said, my concentration and my reading time have been absolutely shot and I've just really wanted to go back and read stuff that I already know and know that I like because even though, you know, it takes some work and concentration to enjoy them, it's not all brand new. 
So I went and reread The, Mar the Marrow Thieves by Sherry Dimoline. I read this last year, I believe I read it for Indigathon, um, because this is by a Métis author from Canada, and this is a sort of science speculative fiction story about a post-apocalyptic world where most people have lost the ability to dream. Everybody that is except for the indigenous people in this area in Canada. So it is about a group of indigenous people who have banded together to survive in the wilderness and try to avoid the people that are, the white people that are trying to come, you know, kidnap them and harvest their bone marrow because they believe that the bone marrow contains whatever it is that lets people still be able to dream. I love this book a lot. It's very short, like relatively speaking to stuff that I usually read, but the way that it is written and the way that consistently shared storytelling and shared stories of dreams are utilized in these different interstitial chapters throughout the book is just so well done that rereading it is a delight. It's the very similar feeling to when you hear a familiar story that you've t you've heard told a bunch of times before and you you know what kind of beats are coming, you know what story beats are coming, but it just still feels fresh and still feels new. I enjoyed this just as much the second time around, if not more. Uh, I did also reread Spellbook of the Lost and Found by Moira Fowley Doyle. This one I had reread, or this one I had read originally last fall around Halloween as well. I think I finished this on Halloween this year, and I didn't actually enjoy this one the second time around as much as I did the first. Um, this is a story about a group of children, not children, I guess they're teenagers, um, in Ireland, and one night they all go to a party, and then when they wake up the next morning, everybody in the village who went to that party has lost something. Some of them have lost, you know, small trinkets, small items, others have lost bigger things, some of them have lost memories, some of them have lost people in their lives that they just can't find, and there's this whole, like, magical aspect to it where there is a spell book, uh, of the lost and found, funnily enough, uh, that is helping people uh, find objects, but in order to find things from your past and in order to find things that you have lost, you have to give something else up. Um, the premise of this story, again, is really interesting, and I still really like this author's work, but I didn't like reading this one as much the second time around because a lot of the plot points felt a bit incoherent and a bit disconnected from each other. I think maybe it was just a problem of having too many points of view in too many different timelines that made it a little bit difficult to tell that story as smoothly as I would like it. So again, didn't enjoy this as much the second time around, but it was definitely like a good mood read for fall and for Halloween and all that. And then I reread what has become one of my very favorite books ever. And that is This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal Elfmatar and Max Gladstone. Again, I read this book, I think I read this book earlier this year, actually. This is one of the first books that I read at the beginning of the pandemic, and it's one of those books that just totally blew me away when I read it. I could not stop thinking about it. It was a book that I'd gotten from the library, and I knew I really wanted to buy my own copy of it so I could have one to read whenever I want, and I'm so glad that I did, because this book just... Mm, it's about... <laughs> It's about two agents that are on opposite sides of a war that is taking place across multiple timelines. Again, it's another sci-fi speculative type story, and you only know them as red and blue. And they're communicating to each other as these spies and these rivals, and they're writing letters to each other across timelines. And as so often happens when you have some very close rivalry with somebody, you begin to appreciate the inner workings of their mind in a very specific sort of way, and you get to know them, and you get to know their thought patterns uh, like your knives sharpening off of each other except knives that fall in love. This is a sapphic book. This is again like a queer book. I really love this aspect of the story. It is I want more stories like this. I want more books like this but really I just want to keep rereading this book over and over again because it's just that good. So if you haven't read This Is How You Lose the Time War yet, do yourself a favor, go pick up a copy of this book. You won't regret it. Alrighty, and then the last thing, whoops, knocking over more stacks. The last thing before I wrap up this video is I did play one new board game this month, and that is PAX Premier 2nd Edition. This box is kind of heavy because it's full of metal coins and meeples, so I'm going to put it down. I managed to play that once, 
um, with my husband, and this is a game that is like an a abstract strategy game, but it's supposed to take place in the historical period in like the Afghanistan area in the early 19th century, and it's supposed to be about like the history of the Afghans who lived there and then the influence of Russian and British imperialism on the region. So it's a strategy game, but there is a lot of historical knowledge and like historical accuracy work that went into making this game. I thought it was really interesting. We had to play it over a couple sessions because we didn't have time to finish the game the first time, but I enjoyed it and I definitely want to play it again. So definitely a, a good game if you like strategy and if you like history games. And that is all I have for you for this video. Um, if you liked this video and you'd like to see more of what I do, go ahead and make sure that you're subscribed to my channel because that is the best way to get updates every time I post a new video. As always, thank you all so very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.